Hey guys, welcome back. In this session, we're going to be talking about the Habitat 67 project that I posted this week. So I just wanted to point out that this is not a tutorial. We're not going to be going through everything in Grasshopper line by line, but the idea of this video is to give you an overview, an idea of how I went about uh, creating something like Habitat 67 using Grasshopper. I'm talk always talking a lot about computational thinking and your computational mindset, so showing you finished scripts all of the time is uh, is not as helpful as showing you some process about uh, how I go about thinking and developing these projects. And they're all very form-based, so you, know, you could apply these logics to many different things, many different scales. Um, form is scale invariant, so it doesn't really matter what scale you're working at. Um, so learning all these techniques or learning about these kind of techniques is always really, really helpful. And it will develop your skills in Grasshopper much quicker. So let's take a look at Habitat 67. I just have a couple of images that I dragged off uh, from Google because I just wanted to quickly talk about like what I see or what I'm looking for when I'm, you know, planning out this script. Because I don't, to be honest, I don't really do a huge amount of planning, um, but I will take a look at a couple of images like this and I'll start picking out some details and some things that I find interesting. So for instance, you know, this looks super random. But if we really look carefully, we can see a series of levels that are involved. You know, obviously floor plates have to connect, so there is a strong um, leveling to this whole project. So that is one uh, feature that I would say that is um, that is quite prevalent that we that we can be able to pick up on and use in our script. The thing that one of the features as well that makes it look like they're all on top of each other a little bit more, and I think maybe you can see it, ah, yeah in this a little bit better. We have our say floor plate here, but the the say unit below oversails the unit above with this um, balustrade. So it kind of looks like the blocks are all interconnecting a little bit more than they than probably they actually are. So um, the idea, this idea at this point for me starts forming where, you know, the balustrade is something a little bit separate. If we could actually just work on, I'll go back a little bit. If we could actually just work on these levels um, and within these levels, we have these boxes um, that all are kind of stacked on top of each other. That would really start to create this form um, a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. The balustrade, which I'm doing a different color, is something that could come second. It gets added on afterwards, and that's what makes this look interlocked. So that is another feature that I noticed that I was like, okay, well, you know, we can use that. I'm going to focus on the green, focus on um, all of these blocks first. So now we're thinking about blocks. We can maybe come over here and, you know, they're not, it doesn't look like they're, um, you know, they're not stacked up uh, precisely like a, a cube grid or a, a regular sort of grid. They're actually stacked um, at 90 degree angles to each other. So, so on the top level or one level, we'll have this, and then below we would have uh, something like the opposite. We would have a cell this way and um, some two connecting blocks this way. So on top of each, and these would alternate at each floor. So this is what I can kind of gather or see from the blocks. And that way we have this really irregular, we have a lot of irregularity to it, but, um, but it's actually following quite a straightforward order. So we have levels, we have uh, this alternating pattern on each individual level, and then we have uh, this, yeah, this idea of these blocks with the balustrade being a kind of additional thing afterwards. The last thing that I was looking at, you know, so fine, this is all well and good, but how do we decide, you know, how do we decide to place all these blocks? So the other thing that I kind of saw was, um, you know, if we drew a line, let's say, just connecting all of these blocks together, we could do, uh, let me change color again, we could do something like this. So if I just drew a center line through this, we could, you could kind of um, reference these blocks to a curve. And this could be how they are set out because they're all kind of clumped together around a three-dimensional curve, let's say. And that's how I'm going to describe it. Uh, so now we're at the point where we're like, okay, I, I, I have enough things to be able to script this because what I'm planning to do with some geometry morphing techniques, um, I'm going to essentially fill the volume of this, uh, of, of this area with blocks following this pattern. 
And then I'm going to subtract, and it's essentially an attractor script. I'm going to subtract um, all of the, I'll create some curves first, and then I'll subtract all of the blocks that are closest or within a range of my curve. Um, and that way, I should be able to create something very, looking very irregular, but following some very simple geometrical rules. So, um, so we have a few things to do. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of all this. Um, we were just going to talk um, more high level. But if we go through to my grasshopper script, we have, um, we have my script here. And I've purposely left this very, very messy. Again, if you were presenting very, um, very polished work constantly, it, uh, I think it, it doesn't show the reality of working in Grasshopper. So, you know, for instance, I work very, very messily. This is, this is where I got to. Um, I, would, I would go back through this, and I still have to go back through this and clean it and give it a lot of order and, uh, and build it into sections with um, telepathy joining everything. But in general, I, I work very, very messily like this. Um, so I can try lots of different things out add different parts in if I need to. This section, for instance, came in uh, much later, and I'll explain why. Um, but it allows you to just work very fluidly. Um, but there ha you ha do have to clean and organize at some point. So this is a script that I would not leave in this condition because I wouldn't know what the hell was going on afterwards uh, every time I came back to it. So I would, um, so I would organize this one. So. But we're just going to go through this at a kind of high level, let's say. I'm not going to go through the nuance of every single thing in detail, but um, the first thing that we're going to start doing is start creating that grid. Um, and we, we, do, we sketched out our grid that we had before. I, well, I've, I've actually, the first thing I'm going to do is, is sketch out and draw out the, the uh, extents of this, um, uh, of the building. Then I'm going to create my level one of pattern. And I'm going to create my level two of pattern. So these are alternating on each level. So uh, if you can see that, the, uh, the pattern changes and flips at each level. And then I'm going to uh, essentially move and extrude and create that solid volume of blocks that I mentioned. And you can even see, you know, these are alternating at each level. We have those levels that we, um, that we pointed out created this uh yeah this full volume not a very interesting building but the second thing that we're going to do and i actually just drew these this is strange for me because i normally draw um i would normally draw everything in grasshopper but i actually just drew and referenced some curves from rhino i think i was i was playing around a lot so and i didn't want to uh, i didn't want to spend a huge amount of time creating those three-dimensional curves we can do it's not a it wouldn't be a problem but um but I think I was just working at speed. So what I've done is I have uh, referenced these curves into, into Grasshopper using a geometry pipeline. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate, take all of our blocks and find a center point, calculate the distance to my uh, the curves on the inside, and we're going to remove any over a certain distance. So we end up with all of these blocks that start giving us this really um, complex looking form, but it's actually just following some very simple rules. And if I, I'm just going to um, disable, disable this just so we can play around. But yeah, if I come through to my cold boxes, I, I have them based on a factor, away, uh, a certain factor away from the uh, curve itself. So anything within, say, two meters is now being kept. But obviously, we need to increase this until we get a form that we're, we're, we like. Obviously, the wider we go, the, um, the, uh, the, more, the more blocks that we have, and we just start carving away. So, you know, already you could see you could use this for many different things or these ideas for many different things. But I, I kind of worked out, I was just eyeballing maybe about seven meters, let's say, based on these, um, based on these dimensions, was giving me something kind of cool. And the idea now, or the simple idea now, is to map some geometry to these. We have our locations and our blocks, and I'm going to create, uh, we're going to use some geometry morphing te uh, techniques to map um, uh, uh, um, our, our blocks or our, uh, a few block designs to um, these locations. So that is what this section is at the bottom. Again, high level where uh, I'm creating a individual little block that has, uh, has some windows on each side. They always have a corner unit as well because uh, the corner units, I didn't point those out, but yeah, the corner units on the images are quite, um, quite important as well. 
these little corner windows. And then you've got multiple different size windows knocking around. There's some small ones, big ones, square ones. So, yeah, looking at this, again, this was a feature, I probably should have pointed this out at the beginning, but yeah, the windows, um, we have multiple different types that are, I would say, just kind of randomly scattered. Um, there's probably is following a slightly more order than, than, than we think, but um, I'm going to use a level of randomness for this. So yeah, I, I've created one, one block here. I've created a second version of my block here, a third version, and I've grouped these all together as individual little, um, yeah, little blocks. And, uh, and just to point out, this is, it's, it's really just taking our, our cell. We are um, uh, I'm extruding and cutting some faces out. We are um, creating some frames, some glass, some frames, and some concrete. Uh, I'm doing like an offset so we get the thickness uh, and grouping all this together. So we're just making one of each one of each block, and it's just reference to the world zero zero, which is uh, which is here. Um, all of our other boxes um, are uh, here, and we're going to remap, or we're going to randomly take our block and remap it. Um, let's see, remap it. We're randomly going to distribute it through all of um, our other blocks. So the the way that we do this is, uh, as I mentioned, through geometry morphing. Um, so we have all of our blocks and we turn them into what's known as twisted boxes. And um, these are a specific type of geometry um, uh, data type in Rhino and Grasshopper. And uh, we are simply going to, oops, we need to turn this section on. I'll explain what this section does in a second because it adds an extra level of randomness into this. But we're now remapping or moving um, our geometry from um, our four locations or the four types of geometry that we, uh, that we created. And we're now morphing them to our final locations. Um, and that takes, so it takes all of our geometry here and it essentially skews them and morphs them to our, um, our, into our twisted boxes. So this is called box morphing. And it takes all of the geometry um, and now we have our random faces, our random concrete, our random windows. And I, I can separate these out into, um, to be different um, materials. So I'll turn this on and this off. And uh, yeah, we, we essentially have all of our boxes here with all of our windows on. And it still doesn't look right because there's a couple of things I've added. There was, um, uh, I added, I wanted a lot more, um, a little bit more variation. So I did some scaling of our, un of our boxes. So they were, they were all a little bit too uniform. Um, so I did some random scaling um, to be able to, um, to be able to give them a little bit more definition. So we go from something like this uh, where all of them are the same proportion, exactly the same dimensions, just to an ever so slight um, uh, scale, uh, non-uniform scaling. Um, so they just it um, adjust the sizes a little bit more. And it just gave a better effect, really. Uh, so those are our twisted boxes, and we extrude them, uh, sorry, we morph them, all of our geometry, and we have all our geometry. The last part of this, uh, again, high level, was our balustrades, um, because all of these don't look, they look like they're stacked on top of each other. They don't look like they're intersecting. So this is going to take, um, and obviously we don't just want to draw a balustrade on top of every single box, because we're going to have balustrades inside, we're going to have balustrades inside the blocks above. Uh, if we do that, because they're all overlapping. So what we do instead, we want to limit the amount of balustrades that we're really creating just to where we want them, really. So there's a few te techniques here about um, isolating our, um, isolating only the, um, the sections that are uncovered. We're, we're isolating out the, and we're just adding in the balustrades where we want them. Um, extruding and then we're putting a hole in them and offsetting them and uh, and yeah and there's a few other things but that starts now to overlap our um, um, overlap our blocks w together with um, yeah with the with the block so it, everything starts kind of interlocking now could even be a little bit higher and so high level that is how this works um, it is a sequence of um, steps that are essentially setting out our base geometry and creating the rules about how the curves intersect with the blocks. We are scaling them slightly, we're creating our individual instances, and then we're re geometry morphing, remapping them to the right location. 
Um, we're separating them out into materials, and then the last thing that we do is we're creating those um, those balustrades. So this is um, this is my this is that approach that I wanted to talk about, and you know going from uh, and that, and that's generally how I work when um, when creating these code nail forms. I will take I'll do some quick sketches over um, some images like this. I will start picking out different features and different um, uh, and different patterns and anything that I can see and start working out you know what what experiences and tools have I had in my past that I can I, I can bring about and use again here um, in order to in order to form this. So, like I said, you know, I've done projects like this, like over and over and over, many times over the years. And so, when you what you what you realize is that a lot of these techniques and ideas and forms can be used again and again and again for many different things and reasons. And it really is about your the creativity of you being able to apply different types of thinking to different types of situation and uh, and develop that computational thinking, that computational mindset. Nothing you ever do and think about is um, is unused and will not be used at some point. Um, as long as you're thinking in kind of systems and blocks and breaking things down into the most simple pieces of, well, simple pieces of geometry, but also the most simple processes that you can think of and then start building that back together, that is, that is the way to get, to get much better at Grasshopper and start building these, um, uh, yeah, building these forms. So I hope that was helpful. It was a bit of an insight into how I work and go about these things. Again, I would never leave this um, so messy. Uh, this will go through a process of cleaning up um, so it's uh, publication ready and be um, able to present a much longer and a much more detailed um, walkthrough um, of uh, that I would, it would probably take about an hour to do the walkthrough of this. So, but you have the high level now, you know, you, you can see how this will piece together. So what would be interesting is to have a go at this yourself. See if you can take this, this logic, I, um, an idea and see if you could actually build this yourself um, as a grasshopper script and what, try to solve all those troubles and uh, that you would, that you would come across. And this will get added to our coding of form library, which, which is all of these projects that are hosted on our website. The coding of form is a membership that we run. So it's really there for you to be able to practice with and, um, and have a go at all of these different types of forms to really learn new techniques all following this logic of developing skills that you can apply to many, many different situations, you know. And this is why I, I always say, and I always use um, a form-based architecture because all of these could be pieces of jewelry, they could be a piece of urban design, they could be an interior um, project. They, you could apply these to many different skills and many different typologies of design. So uh, that is why I like going through these. So. Yes, um, the Habitat 67 will be added to that at some point um, and there will be a much longer walkthrough. But keep in mind, these are intermediate to advanced level. So there is quite a lot going on with them. If you're looking for a lower level entry into everything that we do at TechnoLearn, then reach out and we can discuss the primer and the membership and our one-on-one -on -one coaching programs that we, that we also run. So thanks for watching guys. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And if you have any suggestions for any code and forms that you'd like to see in the future, please let me know. I'd be happy to take a look. Thanks again guys, and I'll see you in the next session.